Hey everyone, it's Wilmer from the Game Academy School again. In this continuing series on Dot's gameplay, let's explore how to create relationships between entities. We'll add a new type of entity in our little demo, a chaser. This is a super common behavior found in games. For instance, if you have an enemy ship or homing missile that is pursuing your player. We'll add an extra component data type, an extra tag, and then we'll revise one of our existing systems. The magic that makes this work is component data from entity, which we'll use to grab the player's position. Anyway, it's not too much extra work, so let's get started. Before we get too far into the lesson, just a reminder that the full course will be available at gameacademy.school at some point. This will feature reorganized content and further development of our mini game beyond what we do here. Sign up for the mailing list with the link in the description to get notified when it's out of preview. The goal is to create a good working foundation in ECS and DOTS. Then you'll have enough confidence to build gameplay systems on your own. Here's where we left off from the last video. If you don't have your project handy, just download the starter file from the GitHub link in the description, but definitely check out the first couple of videos in this series where we set up our basic asteroid-like demo if you haven't already. The packages currently use the universal render pipeline, plus we have the hybrid renderer version 0.5.0 and entities 0.10.0. Your versions may be slightly different in the future, just make sure that you double check your dependencies in the package manager and snuff out any console errors before proceeding. Though we're building this lesson on what we did with the asteroids in the last video, we don't need the asteroids themselves. You can go into the Asteroids subscene and disable the game objects temporarily. That declutters the editor window. And we also want to uncheck auto load scene. We don't want any extra entities showing up in the entity debugger either. If you've done it correctly, we should only have some entities related to the subscene creation and the player ship itself. In the hierarchy, per usual, we'll start with some game objects and then convert them into entities at runtime. Create a new empty game object, and let's name it Chaser. Create another empty game object below that to hold the mesh, and we'll call that Chaser Mesh, just like we did with our asteroid. Add components for the mesh filter and mesh renderer. You can select the Space Fighter model again or choose your own. I'm keeping my game monochromatic, so I'm going to use the same hologram matte material for the renderer. Currently, the chaser is right on top of the player's original spaceship. So let's shift the chaser off to the side and down at the bottom of the screen. To differentiate it from the original spaceship, let's make it smaller and scale it down to 0.5 in all the axes. This thing will move like every other entity in our scene, and we already have a move data component for that. So add move data authoring to the chaser. It works best if the speed is close to the speed of the player's ship. And I think in my case, I have the player's move data speed set to 15, so I'll use something similar. But I'm going to use a very small value for the turn speed, something really tiny like 0.01. The idea is that the chaser has a very similar or faster speed compared to the player, but the chaser can't turn as fast, and that means that the player has to outmaneuver its pursuers. Our spaceship can't win by raw speed. Some skill is needed to avoid the chaser. And we'll see this in action shortly. Like the player's spaceship and the asteroid, the chaser will have the ability to face a certain direction and move forward. And really, we're just going to repurpose the existing systems to do that. So that we can give the chaser distinct behavior from those two other entities, let's give it a unique tag. And you'll remember that a tag is just an empty component. Let's create that in the scripts tags subfolder, right click, and you can either create a C sharp script or I keep forgetting to mention this. You can find ECS runtime component type, name the script chaser tag, and let's edit that. The runtime component type menu option gives you the struct and the I component data automatically, so it saves you a little bit of typing. We don't need these instructions or any of the extra using lines except for Unity entities. And replace the serialize attribute with 
generate authoring component. And basically that's our empty tag component. Drag that onto the chaser game object. And now we have chaser tag authoring. This will convert automatically to a tag when the time comes. The next thing we need is some kind of component data that will link the two entities together. The great part is that it's relatively easy. Let's create a new component called target data. Right click and either create a C sharp script or use the ECS runtime component type. And let's call that target data. Let's edit that script. We have our struct set up implementing I component data. Great. Just add one public field of type entity. And let's call that target entity. Add the generate authoring component attribute. And let's just clean up what we don't need. And basically that's it. That's our magic connection to another entity. In the editor, drag the target data script onto the chaser object. The authoring component has an empty field and you can see that it's expecting a game object. Specifically, you're gonna need a game object that will convert to an entity at runtime. We want the space fighter in here, of course, but that's a no-go at the moment. It won't take that field. The chaser is not part of the subscene, and really it needs to be in the same subscene as a space fighter, at least for now. We'll discuss how to get around that in a later video. Add the chaser to the spaceship subscene, and then drag in the space fighter into the empty field, and bam, we now have a connection with the other entity. At runtime, this entity really is just an ID, an integer. So it's super, super fast compared to how you might reference game objects to each other in classic Unity. An entity is just a number. Let's save the script. And then in play mode, bring up the entity debugger. You'll see our chaser entity. In the inspector, we have a target data component and that has a target entity field with the space fighter's unique index number filled in. This is similar to how we created parent-child relationships between entities when we converted our asteroids. The unique integer is the only thing making that connection between the two entities. Okay, great. So now we have that relationship formed. Next, let's modify the face direction system so that the chaser can always turn toward the player. Okay, so here's our face direction system. And you might recall that we use this to turn the player's spaceship. So let's try to revise this to work with the chaser as well. Currently, we use a couple of systems to translate input keys into a float three vector, and then we take that float three vector and change the ship's rotation values. The chaser can reuse some of this logic, so let's break the script into a couple of parts. This existing entities for each, we wanna reserve exclusively for our player, so we don't wanna change the current behavior. Add a with all or with any filter and then pass in player tag. This will reserve the block of code just for the player's spaceship. Now this part in here, we wanna extract as a separate method so we don't repeat ourselves later. So I'll just highlight these lines and let's extract the method. And this will create a static method and that's typical for a system when you wanna reuse code. And we'll name it face direction, since that's what this logic is actually doing. It makes the entity turn. Now, one thing that we do want to add, though, is a ref keyword in the definition. We want this method to affect the original entity's rotation component, and we need to use the ref keyword or else we're going to pass in the parameter as a copy, which we don't want. Now, typically, this is the workflow that you will encounter when you want to refactor something in a system. You'll likely break off static methods with one or more parameters being passed in by reference with the ref keyword. After we've extracted that, let's set up a separate entities for each and Lambda expression just for the chaser entity. So entities for each, and we can just run that. We never want this to affect the player and we only want to affect the chaser. So we'll pass in the appropriate filters with none, player tag, and with all or with any chaser tag. In order to make the chaser work, we'll need four input parameters. The chaser will calculate its new heading based on the player's translation as a target, a vector difference between the chaser and the player, then we'll go into the move data's direction, and then we'll use that in the face direction method that we just created to turn the chaser's rotation component. 
we'll need to write to the move data's direction and write to the entity's rotation. We'll also need read-only privileges for the entity's current translation and target data. Okay, so we have the player's spaceship stored as an entity ID in the target data. The trick is, how do you turn that into a translation value for the player? And once we have that, the rest will just fall into place. The magic that makes this work is a struct called component data from entity. And that's the title of this lesson. This is a super important thing that's used to build those entity relationships. Component data from entity is actually a native container that gives you access to all of one particular data type. And we'll populate that with the get component data from entity method. You could, for example, grab all of the translations in the current world or grab all the rotations, all of whatever type T you pass into the angle brackets. In our example, we're interested in the player's translation value. Thus, I would create a component data from entity translation, passing the translation type into the angle brackets, store that in a variable, and let's call that all translations or translation group or translation array, something like that, and set that equal to get component data from entity translation. Again, translation in angle brackets. In parentheses, we're going to pass in a Boolean for whether this is read only. In this case, we are only reading it, so we can use true. And then you can access any element of this native container by the entity's index. And hey, we have that. If you just want one specific translation, you can store it in a variable. And we're going to do it just to be more clear as to what we're doing. Translation target position equals all translations. And then look what we have here. We pass in target data, target entity as the index number. And we get the corresponding translation, just like using an array. Once we have its translation, then we just calculate a vector to the target. Float 3, direction to target equals target position value minus pause value. That's the vector from our current position to the target position. And then we can store that in the move data direction. Move data direction equals direction to target. And then we're going to use that in the face direction method that we extracted earlier. Face direction, ref rot, move data. And that basically should do it. We'll take our target entity ID and get the corresponding translation of the target, which is our player's spaceship. We calculate the vector direction to that and then rotate the chaser accordingly. Of course, we need a little bit of defensive programming. If you try to run these lines without a valid entity ID, we'll get an error. So let's just protect against that. Up here, we can use the component data from entities exists method to verify if all translations exists, target data, target entity. And that should be not all translations exists. If the target entity is not valid, essentially, we'll just return. And I'll stuff that in curly braces in case you want to add a debug log warning or something else in there. And this will squelch any errors in case the field is left blank in the inspector. So that's our face direction modified for the chaser. Again, I've broken this into smaller lines for clarity. You can condense this logic once you feel comfortable with all the steps involved. Save the script and let's jump back to the editor. At runtime, the chaser spaceship should now aim at the player, more or less. Its turn speed is probably set a little bit too low, but it does look like it's doing the right thing. As we move the player, the chaser slowly turns to face us. Unfortunately, it's stuck in place, and we probably need it to thrust forward. That's super easy to fix, though. We just need to go to the Move Forward system and edit that. We used the system previously to propel the asteroids, which move along their local positive Z axes. The chasers should essentially do the same thing. The great part is we don't have to do much here. The core logic should work just fine. We just have to edit this filter. Instead of with all asteroid tag, we want to make this with any, and then we'll add the chaser tag. If the entity is either an asteroid or a chaser, then the move forward logic should apply. And basically that's all we need to do. Save the script and let's try it out. In play mode, well, it's working, but the chaser's turn speed is set too low. It's just circling around us. Because the speed is relatively fast and the turn speed is low, it can't turn in time to really chase us. But that's encouraging. 
we can just experiment with some settings. Let's just dial the turn speed up to 0 0.05 and see what happens. That's still about half the turn speed of our player. And that's more like it. We have a bogey on our six, move the player, and our chaser follows us around as intended. And yes, nothing really happens when it catches us. If the turn speed is small enough, it'll just keep circling in a tiny radius. But if the chaser could blow up when it got close, it might suddenly make for some interesting gameplay. Ideally, you want to make the chaser equal to or slightly faster than the player, and that way the player really needs some skill to avoid it. You would need to quickly turn out of the way since the chaser would inevitably catch you if you attempted to fly straight. Now, if you played the casual mobile game called Man vs. Missile, the idea is very similar. Fly straight and the missile destroys you. If you turn very suddenly, then you can avoid it. Okay, well, I realize that without collisions, you'll just have to use your imagination a little bit, but we'll get there, just be patient. For now, experiment with the chaser's speed and turn speed and try moving the starting position of the chaser so it's off screen. Add some more chasers by duplicating the original and shifting the copies around in space. Make sure that you vary their speed and turn speed by a very small amount. You do need to do that, otherwise you're gonna get this effect. Because the chasers have no concept of each other, they only see the player, it's easy for them to bunch up exactly on top of one another. And that makes them look like they're just one spaceship, even if there are dozens. Just adding slight variations in speed and turn speed makes them feel more natural and organic like a real swarm. After a few duplicate chasers, you'll get something that looks like this, and I think that looks kind of interesting. Now it's even more cool when I turn the asteroids back on. So we go to the asteroid subscene, enable the asteroid game objects, let's save everything, and now we have a swarm of tiny missiles or spaceships following our player. And even though it wasn't my intention, I can sort of see making a game like this as a hybrid of man versus missiles combined with asteroids. You dodge through the asteroid field and you try to smash the enemies against the rocks. Okay, so cool. It starts to feel like some game logic. We have a chaser and some stuff to fly around. There is one problem though, and that's the fact that we relied on assigning the player spaceship entity in the editor. If I wanted to do something like move the chasers to their own subscene, then what we did won't work anymore. And you can just try it. Drag the chasers out into the hierarchy and make a new chaser subscene out of them. New scene from selected. And let's save that to disk as chaser subscene. The field in the target data of each chaser now reads scene mismatch. And that's just not allowed. If you try to play the game again, you'll see that the chasing behavior is all broken. So we need a better way to fill this information out automatically. And we're gonna do that with what's called an entity query. But we'll have to wait until part two of the video since we're now out of time. So sorry, stay tuned. But congratulations if you made it this far. Our little mini game is starting to come together and it's pretty neat for not very much work. Now there will be more videos in this series. Just make sure you subscribe and tap the bell icon. And just a reminder, you can check out our classic courses at the Game Academy School anytime. No waiting there, just follow the links in the description to get the maximum discount for our current courses. Okay, well, thanks for watching. This is Wilmer. Until next one, I'll see you in the Game Academy.